Greetings, friends, and welcome back. We're steadily making our way through the Old Testament book of Esther, a fascinating part of Scripture that provides help for living the Christian life today. One of its overarching themes, as we've seen, is the providence of God. God controls everything in the universe he created, serving as the guardian of his own at every moment. Countless verses teach this truth, none better probably than the beloved 23rd Psalm. In that famous biblical passage, we learn that God is our shepherd, and as a result, we lack nothing. He leads us beside still waters. He constantly refreshes our soul. Even in the darkest of valleys, he comforts, he protects, and he abundantly provides everything we need. In fact, the chapter concludes this way, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the providence of God. And in Esther chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, we see a prime example of his care for his own people, not in the magnificent, but in the mundane. Not in things we rarely, if ever, experience, but in ways in which, with which each of us is very, very familiar. Let's pray, and then we'll look together at this next installment in our study. And we do come before you, Father, in the name of Jesus, your only Son, our only Savior. We thank you that the Scripture tells us that Christ uh, created all things and holds all things together. We know that you love us with an everlasting love, so your care for us is active and it is personal and it is loving. And I thank you for that, Father, in a world that's uh, gone astray. In a, a midst of chaos, we have this confidence that you are in control and you love us. You're working a plan, and you'll finish right on time. So all these things encourage us, Father. They encourage also the people of God in ancient Persia, as they do in every age. Help us, Lord, to see together this morning, this time together, um, what you have for us from Scripture. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I want you to see is that God's providence, I want to see God's providence in the consequential things of life. His providence in the consequential things of life. There are many things, right, that are so significant, so momentous, so memorable, that we recognize immediately that God is the one who is doing this. He is the divine actor. We call them God things. The Bible calls them miracles. Scripture abounds with examples. Uh, the creation of the world. The ten plagues that rained down upon Egypt. The parting of the Red Sea. The sun standing still for Joshua. How about the walls of Jericho falling down with a shout? And of course, the provision for the people of Israel in their wilderness wandering of, of manna, bread from heaven appearing on the ground every morning. And of course, in the New Testament, we have the many examples of healing and deliverance during Christ's earthly ministry, and of course, his own resurrection from the dead. These are big, consequential things that only God could do. When the Red Sea was parted, nobody was saying, Holy Moses, how did he do that? God was the doer, and it was obvious because of his providence in these consequential things in life. But more often, far more often, I would suggest, we see God's providence in the coincidental things of life. Not so much the consequential, though, though, though they're there, but in the coincidental things. Unexpected. Un, uh, unexpected, unimpressive, surprising uh, things around us that are the, the normal stuff of personal daily experience. These are things that happen to us. These are decisions that we make along the way. These are encounters that we didn't expect and can't control. And they come to us without divine consultation or explanation. God just makes things happen and we deal with them as they, as they come. So we respond when we're doing it right by recognizing that God is personally and actively involved in the affairs of men. Albert Einstein is credited with saying that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. I like that. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. He arrives without announcement, he speaks without words, and he directs without leaving fingerprints. So let's look at some of the things that happened by chance in this story before us. Because the inspired writer here is suggesting that beneath the surface 
of human decisions and seemingly random events is the unseen hand of the ever-present God of the universe. The first thing is this, uh, in, in the first verse, the king's restlessness was providential. His restlessness was providential. Uh, we see that in the first part of verse 1, Esther 6, 1. That night the king could not sleep. Now that doesn't sound significant, and by itself it isn't. Uh, it's probably every one of us has times when we can't sleep when we want to do that. Now, many things could have weighed heavily on the heart of a ruler that would lead him to bouts of insomnia. But in this case, God wanted to keep Xerxes awake. And the result of his sleeplessness in the very first words of the chapter changed the ending of the story and affected the very course of history. God kept the king awake for this very time, for this very reason. So the king's restlessness was providential. The king's reading material was providential as well, as we see in the second part of that verse and going through, through verse 3. See, as he lay there, fully awake, late at night, he was, I believe, divinely directed to request a reading of the official record of deeds. I mean, there's a lot of things that a king can do to pass away the time. I mean, maybe almost numberless. He has everything he wants. And yet, he sought to have something read to him, the official record of the kings. Here's uh, verses 1b through 3. So, because he could not sleep, one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Now, it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this. And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. God wanted them him to read this material. In fact, they were quite extensive, the journals were, and they added something to them every day. But the particular book chosen by the servants just happened to be, <laughs> just happened to be, from that time, five years ago, when um, Mordecai heard about the, the threat to assassinate the king and sent it to the queen and up the line, and the two were taken care of as a result, and the king was kept safe. We talked about that, studied it way back in chapter 2, if you remember, uh, 2.21. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Temp Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name, and when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, why was this so important at this very moment? Because, friends, remember Haman, we saw in the last chapter, Haman is on his way to the king with the plan to have the man he wants to honor, the man who should have been honored five years ago and was uh, ignored, he wants to have him killed. He wants to have him executed. In fact, he's already in the building. And don't doubt for one moment that the Lord doesn't direct people what they should read, what book they should pick up. I mean, it's a small thing, but it's a significant thing that the king couldn't sleep. It's a significant thing that he read, and that he read this particular volume, and this particular chapter, and this particular event, and had this particular reaction. Listen, there's an example that I read about in 1916 when a British student bought a book at a used bookstall in a railway station. He had looked at the book previously and rejected it probably a dozen times before. But that day, for some reason, he purchased it. God then used the message in the book to eventually lead this young man to faith in Christ. Who was the purchaser? Somebody I bet you've heard of before. It was C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, the greatest and most popular apologist for the Christian faith of the middle 20th century. Lewis later wrote to a friend that he had picked the book out by hazard. But we can hazard a guess that it was actually the providence of God at work in choosing this book at this time so the message could reach this man and he could come to Christ and become the man of God that he did, that has blessed and inspired and helped the church ever since. So the king's restlessness, his inability to sleep, 
was providential. The reading material chosen for him was also providential. Later in, in the next section of, of chapter 6 here, we find that the king was disturbed that nothing had been done to honor this man who'd saved his life. So he sought counsel about how he could make it right, which, which leads to our third example of God's divine involvement that evening, because Haman's rush was providential as well. The restlessness, the reading material, and the rush of Haman to get there, first thing in the morning, it sounds like it was before morning, that was also used of God. No one expected a visitor at this time in the palace, but God sent the perfect choice along, as verses 4 and 5 tell us. Verse 4, so the king said, who is in the court? Now, why would he ask that? Why would he ask that? Who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. It's possible that Haman had been up all night supervising the construction of the gallows on which he planned to hang Mordecai. He wanted to see the king as early as possible to gain permission for the execution. So he, he rushed there. He rushed ahead of time. Remember the advice he got from his family and his friends and advisors was, uh, in the morning, go and get permission to kill him. Uh, Mordecai, take care of it and go to the banquet, right? Remember that? And Mordecai was a prominent member of the Jewish community in Persia, especially in Susa. And the longer his dead body was exhibited on this huge gallows in the center of the city, the more God's people would lose heart about their own future. So this is what Haman wanted. And so he rushed to get there. But, but listen, suppose he had come two hours later. Suppose he'd come a few minutes later. The king would have already consulted with other advisors, and Haman would have been left out of the celebration that the king planned for Mordecai. But that's not what God wanted to happen. So he put it in Haman's mind to get there early, right on time, as it turns out, so that Haman, this is so, this is so important, Haman could become the agent of divine action and play a part in his own coming destruction. Oh, the unseen hand of God through providence is clear upon this whole story. These are all things that happened by chance. But they resulted in great consequences, as the rest of the chapter tells us. Here's how the coincidental that we just described became consequential. That which was small in the, in the short term became huge in the long term. First of all, Mordecai was honored. The last time we saw him, he was sitting at the king's gate, still dressed in mourning clothes and, and covered with ashes. He wasn't able to even speak with the people within the palace because of his condition, because he wasn't that prominent. He had to talk to the queen through couriers. Remember, we, we saw that in an earlier study. What a great reversal we see, beginning in verses 6 through 9. So Haman came in, and the king asked him, What shall be done for the man? whom the king delights to honor. Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom he, the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. This is, this is exactly what he wanted for himself. He is so self-absorbed, Haman naturally assumed, what the king said he wanted to honor somebody, Haman said, well, who could it be but me? I'm, I'm, the, best, I'm the best guy around. So the question was, what did he want? Here's the king asking him, hypothetically, uh, if there was a person that I wanted to honor, how would I do it? Well, so Haman, he, Haman's thinking about himself. He didn't need another promotion. He was already second, and he was number two in the realm. More money wasn't a good way to honor him because he was already filthy rich. No, like all number twos, Haman wanted to be number one, at least for a while. And his quick response tells me he had thought about this a lot. 
Uh, you think about that man's hubris, the pride of man. Um, every senator in Washington sees himself as president. Um, every vice president wants to be president. Number two wants to be number one. Always more, always grasping, always wanting to get higher up the ladder to reach the top. That was Haman. He, had, he just showed the king and us the thing he thought about the most and wanted the most. He wanted to be king. So, wearing the king's own robe, riding around the king's own horse with the crest, partaking in the king's aura of power and prestige would make Haman king for a day. And from that day on, he would be associated with the sovereign of the realm in ways that would prove to be beneficial and personally satisfying. And don't you, don't you doubt that he would have talked about this incessantly for the rest of his life. Remember that time when the king put me on a horse and made me um, his associate in a special way. But again, folks, that's not what the divine director had in mind. Instead, the honor would go to someone else. And Haman would spend the entire day honoring his enemy, Mordecai. So instead of despair at one of their own being publicly killed and left to rot, God's people would get a massive shot in the arm of encouragement that Jehovah hadn't forgotten them at all. So the whole thing is for the individual. The whole thing is also in God's plan for the blessing and for the encouragement to his people moving forward to something that he would do that would be the greatest reversal of all that would change the whole thing and become then the, the basis for the Jewish Feast of Purim that they celebrate even today. Can you picture the color draining out of Haman's face as we read verses 10 and 11? Then the king said to Haman, who was probably ready to say, I accept, and he had a speech ready to go. Here's what he said. Hurry, take the robe and the horse, yeah, as you have suggested, right, right, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback throughout the city square, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. His own words used against him. Don't you think he choked on those words every time he spat them out? And yet that's what God wanted, and that's what God happened. How galling, how unexpected, how unfair in his eyes. Mordecai was honored. That's the first consequence of God's working coincidentally. But also Haman is what was humiliated. First he had to go to the king's gate, get the man that he despised and bring him to the palace. Then he had to dress him in the king's robes. Finally, after putting Mordecai up on the king's horse, he had to lead him through the city, lauding his achievements and singing his praises. What irony! What irony this was! For an entire day, Haman had to act like Mordecai, a person he felt was unworthy to him in every way, was somebody important and valuable to the king. Haman wasn't just humiliated, he was utterly humiliated. He was a laughingstock in the city and beyond. Finally, the day came to an end, and as we see this in verse 12, and the story continues, here's 12. Afterward, after the end of this day, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered. True to character, when it's all over, Mordecai simply returned to the palace, his place at the gate outside the palace, right, where he served the king, as if nothing special had happened. Applause doesn't change a truly humble person because they're living for something deeper and stronger and more important. Haman was another matter entirely. Without character, with no integrity, he slunk home with his head covered. Picture him with a ski mask. Picture him trying to cover. He'd had enough of this public. He usually wanted to be seen by everybody. Not, not now. Not in this place. He slunk home. He skulked home, hoping nobody would see him in his humiliation and degradation. Where he always sought glory, he now experienced a new emotion, and that was humiliation. And it discouraged him, it defeated him, it demoralized him. There was no way to spin it. This was a disaster. This was not the way it was supposed to go. This is not the way it was going at the beginning of the day. This is not the way his friends and family 
told him it would happen, and he has to confess that he's, that he's become a laughingstock. Maybe he gets some relief at home, but it wasn't to be, as the last two verses tell us in 13. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men, his advisors, and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before you, whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Wow, how the mighty have fallen. What a contrast from the last family gathering, right? In chapter 5, 10 through 12, where they said, you're the best, you're the greatest, uh-huh, you bet. Here's what you need to do. You're going to win. Um, you're our guy. Um, no, they, they, they realize. You know, the, the Persians were very superstitious people, folks. And they, they saw the handwriting on the wall, if you will, um, and already told him, this, this, this doesn't look good for you. Now, Haman knew that. But hearing this from them wouldn't have helped his mood. Verse 14, while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. That was the second banquet, right? It's obvious that God was warning this arrogant man about what was to come, but Haman wouldn't listen. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself to God and, and he, the devil will resist. You, you can resist the devil. James tells us that in chapter 4. But a person who's proud doesn't listen to the Lord, does not submit to him, thinks that they're the top. And so Haman doesn't listen. And before he had time to think further, the king's eunuch arrived to escort him to the banquet that would end up being his very last meal, folks. Now let's make some application as we close. Isn't it true that God has worked in your life, my friend, watching, listening to me today? often through unexpected and seemingly insignificant things that ended up being consequential. For example, consider the chain of events that led to your conversion. The most significant work of God in your life is when he called you to himself from death to life, from darkness to light, and made you part of his forever family. Perhaps it happened with you that you were randomly uh, changing the channels on the TV or radio when you happened upon a preacher whose message began a transformation in your life. Maybe in your example, in your experience, it was someone handing you a tract that the Lord used to break through your spiritual blindness. Maybe it was an unexpected invitation to church one day that led you to profess faith in Christ. The, the numbers of ways and the series of events and the chain of events are, are many, multitudinous. But in these ways, whatever they were in your life, God came to you and gave you life. Consider how God has guided you since that time of salvation. How did you come to meet and marry your spouse, for example? Why are you living in the place that you are? What circumstances led to your current job? All of these things happen through a series of coincidences, things you couldn't control, or decisions you made without thinking about it, or decisions that were made for you. <laughs> a pandemic comes along, somebody, a, a business downsizes and you have to move. All of these things happened, but through those things, through those coincidences, those normal things, by chance, God has directed you in the very direction he wants you to go. God has moved in you and on you and has given you, exact, put you exactly where he wants you to be at this time in your life. Now, many of the things that come into our lives like this are unpleasant and unwanted, ugly, difficult, even tragic. God has used things like the death of a loved one or a serious illness or wayward children, broken relationships, shattered dreams as, as links in his providential chain as well. It isn't just the good things. It isn't just the things that Mordecai experienced. It's the things that Haman experienced. There are things in the chain that makes up the providence, God's constant care of his own and maintenance of the universe he created to accomplish his greater purpose. It doesn't matter. As a child of God, we know that all things are working together for good and that none of these things changes anything about how God feels about us. Now, as the scripture says in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, 
we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I love this part. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our final destiny of glory in Christ is guaranteed, brother and sister. So trust God's unseen hand in both the consequential and the coincidental. Do it today. Do it every day. It will revolutionize your life. And it will make you the effective servant of God that he wants you to be and you need to be as we approach the end of the age. And with that word, we close another exciting study in the book of Esther. And I hope to see you again next time.